work back to Project Kermit. So we've got three things to concentrate on this time. The doors, the seats and the entire electrical system. And they're going to leave the doors and the seats for now because that gives us better access to the cab. And for the electrics, I'm going to start with the back lights just because it's nice and straightforward. This is most of the stuff that I'm going to fit on the back of Kermit, uh, including the number plate and a brand new set of lights. You might remember that back when I did the tub, I was expecting to replace all the brackets that go underneath it at like 50 quid each. And I didn't have to replace them. Um, they were all good except for two which I was able to repair and they're all fitted. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because I felt like I'd saved loads of money, which I immediately then spent on upgrading the lights. So I splashed out on some an LED upgrade kit. So this is a Defender kit. Um, it's the YPAC brand. An interesting thing about YPAC is that when I looked into it, um, as far as I can gather they're a Chinese company, but the lights are made in England. So that's an unusual way around. And the reason I did this is because the the standard Land Rover lights I hate. They're really really cheap and that's it. That's well, and they look nice actually. They, they do, I do like the look of them, but they're rubbish. They fill up with water. Um, they where they fix to the bodywork. They that all rots. They're just a horrible design. The military ones are much better, but obviously difficult to get now. You know, it's been missing a brake light at the moment because that's um, been pressed into service on the on the Yamaha. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm. I will take it back off though, obviously. I've also got a reversing light and a fog light and a number plate light. First thing I'm going to do though is fit the number plate because that will obviously tell us where to put the number plate light and it will give me some idea of where I can fit in the fog light and the reversing light, which I've got no idea about just yet. These lights come with these connectors to connect them straight into a Defender wiring loom. Obviously I haven't got a Defender wiring loom. And for reasons I'll explain in a bit, I'm not going to use connectors like that either. So I should have pointed out the reason that I like these so much is because they're completely potted by which I mean they're weather sealed because you don't need to change the bulbs in, in an LED fitting or at least you shouldn't if it's any good. Everything inside here is completely sealed up. Don't take the fact that I'm fitting these as a recommendation necessarily because like much of Kermit it's completely untested as yet. Well apart from the brake light being used on the motorbike for the moment and in fairness it does a good job there so it's hardly a proper test so far at least I'm impressed with the quality I can say that much I'm going to solder the joints that's my plan solder and um, uh, heat shrink because if you think about it the plugs they're really there for assembly, it's to make life easier in the factory. Well that's smart now, the back already isn't it? <laughs> Doesn't it look great? I'll give my a little tweak now, everything's installed. It's not a legal requirement for Kermit to have a fog light, but it's definitely a good idea. Oops. 
Rather now I do have these light guards to go on, well, they need quite a bit of straightening out, they go on like that. I'm not sure yet whether to fit them because I don't have any to go over these lights, they might look a bit dull. They are surprisingly useful though. Anyway I'm not going to fit them yet because I'll probably have to take these lights out and do the wiring so I'll, I'll pull them out, wire them up and put them back in one by one. But that's a good start. <laughs> I think that looks rather smart. There is still more to go on here. I need to um, fit some reflectors, which I've only recently ordered, they haven't turned up yet. And I need to find somewhere to put the uh, towing socket. Probably there. But for now, let's go to the front of the vehicle and I'm going to fit the rest of these and the headlights as well. I've got Y-Pack headlights and headlight bulbs as well. Not LEDs though, just uh, conventional halogen ones. I don't see any real benefit of LED headlights. They look funny and they're incredibly expensive. Um, these white pack ones, I ordered these thinking they were glass and when they turned out they were plastic, which is a bit disappointing, but I'm, I'm going to go with them anyway. These are the quad optics. They're supposed to have a good beam pattern. I'm going to find out at some point. I'm really looking forward to putting the lights on the front, actually it's going to completely change the look and make it more, <laughs> more vehicle light, less project light. What a difference! <laughs> Gosh, this is a moment that has been a long time coming. That's the front end looking complete. Obviously, the lights don't work yet. Still plenty to do, but the look is there. That's what I'm trying to get across. The look is there. I'm very happy with that, that's exactly as I had in mind. Whew. Washers and wipers next. This is the mechanism that powers the wipers. Uh, this is obviously the washer bottle. This is the one that came out of Kermit, and that's going back in. This is the one that came off Kermit as well. I've got a new little pump for the washer bottle, and might as well fit these as well. I think this kink is supposed to be here, but <laughs> we'll find out. So the motor fixes there. The rest of it, <laughs> I can't remember. So this hole I can get to the other side of. Um, under the bonnet. This one I can't really, so I'm going to put a rivet nut in there.
with our tube. Let's move from there. Let's see if we can get any life out of this motor then. Uh, this lead just goes straight to the battery now. I'm just going to play around with the terminals. Yeah, no, that's a short. <laughs> Open that. Yeah, it's shorted out, yeah. Ooh, darky, but no, nothing else. Well, I can't get any life out of this motor, whatever I do. So I'm gonna try dismantling and have a look inside. There's the parking switch. I wonder if that's been causing the trouble. See if we can shine this out. That should help. Okay, there we go. So that's spinning and it's spinning really quietly now as well, so that's good. Um, concave towards the gear wheel, so that's way round. So that goes in there like that. Right, so I think that's fully over. So that should be working around there. <laughs> Got some sewing needles. reading the manual and it says that judder may be caused by the arm here not being um, parallel to the windscreen. I'm going to try just twisting that. You never know. Is it, yeah, might just need to do that. I'd be amazed if that's the, uh, that cures it, but it might. Well, there we go. <laughs> I'm amazed. I always thought juddering was down to the, um, the actual wipers. So, that's good. So with that mesh installed, I can start thinking about the dash. 
Now the dash comes in a bunch of sections. Some of them, well I'll show you. <laughs> Some of them are completely shot. This bit, the top part of the dash, I think is usable. Well, I intend to try to use it. So this goes in. Probably looks fine on camera, but if I show you up close, you see that this bit here, the demister, at the other end is that's missing. Um, it's a big split in the vinyl here. The end cap's missing off here. <laughs> this is a scrap bulkhead. Um, it's been dead handy as a reference for rebuilding that one. And with the odd spare part here and now, I've been able to pull off of it. We do have both of those vents. We've got one end cap. Here's the rest of the dashboard bits that I've got to work with. This is the lower dash. And you should be able to see there, it's completely shagged. There is no bringing this back, it's like tissue paper. Hopefully though, we don't need it. I'm going to try and do without that. I'm going to try and minimise the dash quite a bit. What I'm going to try and do is make something that's a bit less plasticky. This is a um, Series 2 dashboard. And, I don't know, it might, <laughs> I might be able to incorporate that in there. But what I'm probably going to do is just make up one from scratch. And so what I'm going to aim for is um, a bit like a Defender setup but with even less plastic, so even simpler. So we'll have a speedo, and then a voltmeter, a temperature gauge, and a fuel gauge. I'm not gonna buy a Defender dashboard, and because I'd have to modify it loads anyway, I might as well just make one. I'm also gonna have a whole load of um, warning lights and toggle switches and things like that, and just make it a bit neater than even the Defender ones. So let's get the upper dash on here and pull that apart. When it comes to this top part of the dash, it's actually in pretty good nick. The only bad part was here, where there was a big hole in the foam. And as you can see, I've re well, repaired is, is a bit of a grand word. I've pumped in a load of this expanding foam, this stuff, which as you can tell by the mess on the table here was a fairly dramatic process. Other than that, like I say, there's no splits in the vinyl here, but it is looking pretty manky. What I'm going to try and do is recover it. So I found some vinyl on eBay, it didn't cost me much. And I'm just going to go over the vinyl that's here. I'm not sure if that's a good idea or not, but it seems to me that I'm going to have more of a chance of recovering the vinyl on top of what's here than take it off and deal with the 40 plus year old uh, foam that's underneath. Start with the bottom and then see how we get on. Anyway, this would be a lot easier with two people, but as a 
Considering that's my first attempt, <laughs> I'm actually quite pleased with it in the end. Whew. Right. I'll stop messing with that one. I do hate working with contact adhesive. You just get one shot at it, really, and then there's, there's not a lot of wiggle room. But is it acceptable? I think it is, you know. Got a whole selection of reflectors to go on the back here. These ones are genuine Land Rover Defender. I think I might put those up there. These are generic, but I got these because they're the right size to go here. I might even put two. The last thing to be fitted up the front end, or at least for now, is a horn. And I've just bought a new one. I had a collection of about four or five Land Rover horns, but when I time came I needed one, out of all of those, exactly one worked, and that's on my motorbike now. So just a bog standard horn, and it usually goes somewhere inside the grill, and I think I've got a place for it. Well, that was easy, relatively. The next job's not going to be there. And that's at the other end. The last electrical thing to install before I start wiring everything together is this, the towing socket. And I want to put it here in the, this is the hole for the rear PTO. Now this isn't used. I mean, I'm not going to run a PTO anyway, but even if I did want to run one, I couldn't because the fuel tank would be in the way. Um, it's not in the way at the moment because I've, <laughs> I've had to drop it to give myself access to the back of this. Now this is something I wish had occurred to me <laughs> when I was doing the chassis because I could, could have just welded in a little bit of sheet metal to accommodate that. It would have been so simple. This is how far I've got so far. You can see here there's some rivet nuts installed waiting to accept a plate and then, well, I'll show you the rest of it. So I've cut this plate from a bit of scrap that I found under the workbench and I cut this circle out as well using a hole saw. I found a bit of tubing and cut a section of that. So this will go where we were just looking behind the cross member. And then this will be welded to it with a hole in the middle so the cable can go through. That will sit there and be welded on there. And then that will sit there.
what I want is to paint the inside of this. So I've got a little funnel, put that there. I'm just going to stick my finger over the hole on the bottom, pour this in the top, and see what happens. There we go. So instead of a hot dip galvanised treatment, that's a cold dip galvanised treatment. As the bracket is now all ready to fit, except we need a cable gland. But of course this bit has got to be on the inside. I'm tempted to warm it up, but the trouble is if I warm it up and squeeze it, it'll probably stay in, in that shape. So at least at the moment it's springy. <laughs> there it is. This will either be easy or difficult. I think we're there. Haha. <laughs> of the seven core cable that's going to go up over the chassis. The cable has come up into the bottom of this box here and I'm going to put it onto this junction box which will also hold the rest of the uh, lighting wiring. Well, that worked out really well. It's smart and it's functional and it makes use of something that would otherwise be redundant, namely this uh, PTO hole. With that installed then I can put the fuel tank back in and Kermit will be mobile once more. Right. Mm. So I've got this vent cover that's ready to fit on there. 
but it's got to connect with the intake of the blower just here. So there needs to be some kind of tubing connecting this with the blower and I don't have anything suitable. What I do have though is a yoghurt pot. You see there how neatly that sits around the blower intake. A spook. Calculations are correct. What should sit there? There we go. Time to get stuck into the wiring then. I should have all the appropriate tools and I got all these when I did the battery room next door. I've got the remnants of Kermit's wiring room, which I probably won't use. I might use a little bit of it. I've got what I think is probably fairly complete series 3 loom, which I won't be using. And I've got miles of wiring from the old telecoms truck that we uh, that me and Mark pulled apart a couple of years ago. Remember Project Awesome? <laughs> it will return, but not until this project's done. Also on the bench here we've got my Great big soldering iron. That must be a classic. Certainly vintage. A multimeter for checking continuity and voltage. And a little battery for testing. This big reel of cable for running the earth. A little fuse box. A big box of heat shrink. An even bigger box of crimp connectors. Um, and this is what I mean by custom things. This is going to be the indicator stalk, but we'll get into that in a bit. I'm not going to stick very closely to Land Rover's original spec for the wiring because, well, for one, it's now a custom vehicle, so a lot of the wiring goes out the window. Um, but also, I've been reading quite a lot on the various Land Rover forums of accounts of people that have done a full rewire. And I picked up a couple of tips which I'm going to use here. One was that a chap said to work from the corners, start in the corners and work your way in. So I'm going to do that. Um, also to earth it. Now there's, I've always had earthing. Most of the problems, electrical problems I've had on Land Rovers over the years have been down to earthing. And what he suggested and what I'm going to do is to earth it, bring all the earth points to each corner, to the chassis and then back to the battery. So we'll carry on from where we left off, which was that multi-core cable coming from the trailer socket into this box here. This junction box will also have the um, cable coming from the front of the vehicle and go to the corners to do the all those lights. bolt through there. All of these ones are wired in now, so I've commoned up all the earths into one and then I've had to common up two lives because obviously we've got a 
tail light on the end here and the number plate light. So this is the bundle of wires that's going to cross over to that side. And I found a bit of conduit so I can at least protect it for, yeah, I'd say the whole of the underneath there. Wasn't too bad. So now we can go down. Right, and that side's done, all clipped in and tidied up. This side's all in, it needs tidying up, but first I'm going to test it. This is the multi-core cable, it's going to go all the way to the front. I'm going to just bear some of this back, and then we'll test all of these lights, uh, just using this little battery here. Uh, fog light first, yes, the brake lights, the tail lights, yeah. And number plate light came on as well, to the left. Yep, the indicator right, yep. Finally you've got the reversing light, yes. <laughs> Look underneath now and you can see those cable glands. Uh, yeah, so you can see there's two cables there and then the other two there. So I've run it all along the chassis underneath. You know, you can just see it there. And here it is, I haven't cut it down to length yet. And that's that. I'm going to now just turn comb it around and we'll start plumbing in the front lights. Similar procedure to the rear of the truck then. I'm going to run the earths from the lights to a local point, common them to a local point, and then join those points together and then run them back to the battery. Um, the lives will run straight into the cab. The exception though is the headlights. And for the headlights I'm going to use some relays. Standard setup on an old Sirius Land Rover is that the power for the headlights comes from the uh, battery to the dashboard switch and then to the lights. Sounds simple but that means you've got all the power for the headlights going through the dashboard. And once the wiring starts to degrade a bit um, they can and do catch fire and that's actually happened to me. That happened to me in the other Land Rover. So what I'm going to do instead is fit the system that they've got on later vehicles which is to have in the dashboard is just a switch. Um, you're just switching the relay. The relays are mounted locally to the headlights and the big power cables come to the relays not into the dashboard. So there's much less power going through the switch. It's just a, a more reliable more sensible system. So I've got three of these relay mounts, um, one for the low beam, one for the high beam and another one for the engine fan. I'm going to uh, um, drill into the chassis and establish an earth point down here and another one down there. And then everything on this side will go to that one, everything on this side goes to that one, join them together and run them back to the battery. Easy peasy. So I've got, obviously, <laughs> I've got no qualms about reusing uh, electrical wire as long as it's in good nick. And all this stuff that came out of that telecoms truck is mint. Some of um, Kermit's old wiring is not. <laughs> if the camera picks up this one, you'll see that this is quite crispy. <laughs> that's an, this is actually a headlight cable and that's what I was on about. That's the issue of not having relays in there. Um, Especially when you put in halogens, the cabling just can't cope with it. I am aware, by the way, of the Lucas standard colours, and if I was buying wiring, I would probably make an attempt to follow that. Well, I, I definitely would. But since I've got all this, I might as well use it. <laughs> and as long as I keep a track of the colours, I really don't see it's really an issue. bulb in and then we need a, a H4 connector to go on here. So Kermit's headlight connectors are partly melted so not really much point messing about with those. 
Fortunately, I was able to pick up some headlight connectors locally. I went for the ceramic ones after seeing the partially melted one that came off of Kermit. I think the ceramic one seemed like a sensible upgrade. And while I waited for the shop to open, <laughs> I disentangled that absolute mess of, of wiring and sorted it all out. So now I can tell exactly what I've got and how much I've got of each one. This is um, flux core solder, but I find putting extra flux on is a good idea as well. There's a little rubber bung inside here in the shape of a cone that acts as strain relief for the cabling. And if I curl that round, it can go like that. It'll be just like that. There we are, all tidied up and secured. So a P-clip there, a P-clip there, and a grommet there. Done inside this wing now, and tidied all that up. The main lines go over and come out here. These are the earth returns. I've got to attach those to an earth point down there. And then what I'm doing here is getting ready for the to put on the connectors for the relays. So these are the relay holders. And of course these are the actual relays. So they'll plug in like that. These are fuse holders on the front. So I'm going to use two fuses for each circuit. Uh, remember there's two of these are for lighting and one is for the fan, the engine fan. Which is and I've just come up with a wiring plan. So it's dead simple. I mean, <laughs> it looks like everything. It looks complicated until you can wrap your head around it and then it actually turns out to be quite simple. So it's sim the relays are simply um, a way of switching the high current without taking the high current lines into the cab. So we're going to have a incoming live um, unfused, which I'm going to have to sort out. I'll do that in a moment. I'm going to take it from the starter motor stud. Um, so that'll come round, come in here through a 30 amp fuse, and then it will couple to pin 30. And what happens when you switch in the cab, you're switching through this circuit and this 15 amp fuse, you're switching these two and they in turn switch the high current circuit here. So it comes in at 30, just stays there normally, but when you switch on the high beam, it then comes out at 87 and goes to the headlights. And similar with the, the uh, low beam and then the fan, same sort of thing. These are now spliced together and then I've got a selection coming off of here. So I've got um, two fat lines for the headlights, one for the fan and then I've got a spare. So that's it all hooked together. So I should now be able to test it by putting 12 volts down one of the signal wires. So here's the two I'm going to use for lighting. And if I do that, it should be a click in there and the headlight should come on. <laughs> it works. There we go, that's low beam. And then that's high beam there. <sighs> Excellent, well that's great, that's a, that is a reasonable leap forward. Oh, 
Here we've got everything from that side of the vehicle that came through that spiral wrap around the back of the engine. And here we've got everything from the rear of the vehicle. All this wiring might look complicated, but it's actually dead simple once you can break it down. And that's why I started with the <laughs> with the easy bit at the back and started at the corners and worked my way in. And that way it's just all made sense as I've gone along. I haven't tried to dive in and work out what every wire was right from the beginning. So I've jammed down the pedal, let's go and have a look at the back. Look at that. Excellent. Well that's a big relief because I hadn't, I'd completely forgotten to test the brake switch before. And um, yes, I'm very glad I don't have to take the pedal box out again. This is the column stalk that came with Kermit. Um, I'm not going to use it. I don't... <laughs> it's a horrible thing really. This is a proper uh, 1970s British Leyland item. This is a good one. Um, but it still it doesn't inspire confidence. It's, it's a really flimsy, horrible thing. So this does the this sits on here on the column, and it does the indicator one way and the other way. You pull it to flash the lights, go the other way for low beam or high beam, and press it for the horn. So I'm replacing this just because I don't like it with this one. So this is a much nicer unit. Um, I can't remember how much it cost, but it, it wasn't painful. But this is, there's a lot more metal in this, it's much heavier, it's chunkier. The, the main reason for, that I started looking for these was because I, I wanted to do without most of the plastic that goes with a Series 3. So all the, all the shroud that goes around the, um, the steering column, I'm not having any of that. So I wanted something a lot more like the Series 2 but the Series 2 one just does the indicators, whereas this does the exact same functions as, as this one. So what I've got here is the relay that came with the LED light lighting kit. Um, so a normal indicator relay would flash too fast with LEDs because they're so low a current draw. So I've hooked all this up. Um, yeah, that should be live, so I'm check it right to the back. Yes. So here's a good example of why this whole process is taking so long. This is a simple hazard warning light circuit but this simple circuit took me <laughs> several days of pondering and believe it or not a whole day to put together so i've ordered another one of these these are the special uh, indicator relays that work with leds and with um, incandescent bulbs there's a warning light i've got a whole bunch of these to put on the oh, I don't know what we call it the middle dashboard let's say and i've got a few of these these are lovely really nice quality switches. I can't tell you where I got them from because <laughs> I can't remember. It was at least 20 years I've had these, a bunch of these, about four or five of these in the box waiting for a suitable project. But properly all made out of um, brass and baker like. It might not look like it but the wiring is actually becoming more organized at least in my head. Um, I'm going to fit this now, that binnacle bracket. I've just scrubbed it down and given it a quick whiff of paint. We'll go in there and with this support bit on the bottom. Once that's in I can um, make a mock-up of where the clocks are going to go. Um, so we've got the speedo and then the other clocks and talking of which I didn't when I was doing all the engine bay wiring I didn't put in the line for the uh, for the temperature gauge which is a, <laughs> a bit annoying. Um, easily rectified though so we'll just run a line in that goes from the uh, temperature sender at the front of the engine straight to the clock. Um, yeah, the voltmeter that's obviously easy, and then we've got the fuel gauge as well. I completely forgot the clocks. Anyway, we should sort them out. My plan. So 
So put the speed as low as possible, the other three on the same center line. That's good, so I've got uh, an idea of what I want to do there now. What I'm up to at the moment is testing out the cockpit instrumentation, so the uh, gauges and the warning lights. While the engine's warming up, I can show you the fuel gauge. There we go, that's about what's actually in the tank. I'm going to put the glow plug relay in in a moment, and I'm going to install it down here where the other relays are, so they're all together. Um, and then I think that's it in the engine bay. Now once I've hooked in the glow plug relay and tidied up the wiring again, I've got a couple of things I want to do in here. I'm going to put in an ignition switch. So this is just a this is off a tractor and it's just an on off no start because I've got a starter button that I'm going to use. I'm also for extra security going to fit this tiny little key switch. So this is uses these sort of keys. I've forgotten what they're called now. And that again it's just, it's just an on off switch. This I'm going to put in line with the um the fuel solenoid so that if this is off the engine will crank, the ignition will come on, the engine will crank, but it will never start. So it's just a bit of additional security. I'm also going to put in a battery isolator, a great big battery isolator, which again has got a key on it. So I'm going to have three keys <laughs> for this thing. Um, I'm going to put the battery isolator by the battery box in a secret location. Also in the cab, I'm going to put in the uh, indicator relays. So the other one turned up, so I've got one for indicators and one for hazards. And the reason for that is because I wanted the, the main reason is I wanted the indicators to be active when the ignition's on and the hazards to be permanent live. Also, having two of these provides redundancy. So if, if one pops, I can, well, if the indicator one goes, I can put in the, the hazard will become a spare one effectively. Also, these are both, um, well, I've seen them described as hybrid relays, which means that it doesn't matter if you've got um, incandescent bulbs or LED bulbs or a mixture of both. And here I do have a mixture of both in that they're all LED lights around the outside. And then in the instrument cluster, like in here, these little bulbs are going to be incandescents. But even if it was entirely LED, there may, may be a situation, well it will be a situation, where I plug in a trailer board which will have incandescent lights in it. So anyway, these can cope with both types of lights. So I've got some, a couple of cheapo brackets for these. These are just a version of what I had before, but it doesn't have the um, fuses in, because these will be fused from the fuse box. So they'll go together like that, and I'm going to find a place to put it, probably just there. I'm just about to mount the glow plug relay, I'm going to stick it there and this is going to be the high power wire going to the glow plugs and see I put a butt crimp in that one. I'll do the same on there, that's the electrical feed and then we've got two signal wires that are going to go up to the cab. Put the temperature gauge wiring inside a bit of conduit just to protect it from the engine heat and then that goes over there, uh, where's it going? over here and there I split the conduit, so I split it open and that's because it picks up the uh, oil pressure wire and the solenoid, the fuel solenoid shut off wire which is just down there and then they'll go together and then I've got to take all this spiral wrap off and redo that with the signal wires and with these wires embedded in there too. We are getting there. So what I'm going to do next is put in this, which is the um, 
Oh, it's actually the stop and go switches from my dad to lave. <laughs> it's going to be engine start and glow plugs. Because they're nice switches. Yeah. It's done. The electrics are done. I know it doesn't look very really done, but all the circuits are installed. Everything works properly. I've got the permanent live circuits, so that's the horn, the lights, and the hazards, and I've got everything else working off the um, ignition switch. Everything's properly fused. I've got the proper relays where they should be. It's all. <laughs> it all works. I'm happy with what's in the engine engine bay, that's all really nice and I'm happy with what's at the end of the vehicle as well. Obviously this needs a lot of tidying up. Um, I can't do that tidying up until I install the dashboard and the dashboard I can't really do because the shape of the dashboard is going to be dictated to a large extent by the heater duct. Many of you will be familiar with those um, cheapo Chinese diesel heaters that are all the rage at the moment. I'm not fitting one of those, but what I have got is all the accessories, or a whole load of accessories that go with those heaters. Um, the heaters are so popular, the accessories are dirt cheap. So this is what's going to form the ducting from the heater. So the hot air comes out of here, um, round a corner, into that splits to the demister and to the cab and so on and so forth. So to me the main achievement apart from actually installing the circuitry is getting the whole everything in my head. <laughs> Once I can wrap my head around it then it's just work like everything else in this project. So it's all I know my way around all the circuits now finally and everything is noted down in the little notebook as well. So I've got all the colours that I've used listed out here. I've got schematics for the relays, the relay layout, um, fuse boxes, the glow plug relay and the hazard relays. It's all in here. At some point I'll draw this up into a proper circuit diagram because although it's all in my head at the moment <laughs> it, it won't be forever that's for sure or even very long. So I've made a start on the dashboard by making this template the shape is going to go there. Um, there'll also be some kind of shelf there, some kind of front panel, which is where all these switches are going to go. So all the auxiliary switches and the ignition switch, the start button, um, the fans, the lights, and all that kind of stuff will go about there. Probably something there. I don't know yet. <laughs> but I'm going to take a break from looking at all this for a bit, and next up I'm going to sort out the seats. Next up then, we're going to make these seats fit properly and do a little bit of refurb on them as well. They're in reasonable condition, but they do have some damage on them because obviously they were, well, they came out of a well-used vehicle. <laughs> I was looking around for various seat covers, but I didn't really like the look of any of them. I don't like the sort of universal waterproof seat covers. because They're too, uh, they're like sitting on a crisp, a giant crisp packet. Then I realised that Exmoor Trim did some really nice um, canvas seat covers for these, but they don't seem to make them anymore. But then, and even when they did, they were really expensive. But then I had a real moment of luck, and on eBay I found some somebody selling new old stock, or old but unused, um, canvas seat covers. So I haven't even tried these on here yet. I bought these about six months ago. <laughs> and I haven't got around to offering them up yet. But if these fit, I should be chuffed a bit, I think. It fits, I am chuffed a bit. <laughs> if you want my review of something you probably can't buy anymore. I really like them. These are a proper nice heavy duty thick Cordura type material. Very nicely put together. And I say that as someone who knows his way around the sewing machine in place, to a small extent. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I do have to sort out is this, the seat base. This rubber has perished, it's no good at all. 
and as a consequence at the moment it's like a proper bucket seat you just vanish down into the bottom there so I've got something to sort that out a pair of these so that's just a sheet of rubber with all these hooks around it I'm going to do is to get it nice and square to the seat box and then I want to get the middle of the seat um, to line up with the middle of the steering wheel. Also, I don't want the seat to go any higher than it is already. Otherwise a few more pies and I'm not going to fit under the steering wheel. So you can see here the seat box isn't made of anything particularly sturdy, not of this top here anyway. I'll take this panel off. See this is just wibbly aluminium. You can see I can actually flex that. <laughs> so the seats that came out had these folded sections which sort of spread the load. So like one there and one there. Might be able to reuse these actually. But I need something like this, something that's rigid like this, spreads the load and can be bolted onto this. And what I might do is put the, um, there was a box in there, I might reinstate that. I've also got to allow for the fact that I need to get to the battery on that side and potentially to the box on this side if I put it back in. Now I don't need easy access to either of those, but I do need access. So if I could attach these rails onto these rails, obviously chop off this bit, um, that would work. The other option would be um, angle iron to cradle that which might be more sensible because I don't want to raise the seat by that much. I've got a plan. It's taken me a lot of pondering <laughs> but I've got a plan. I think I have it sussed. This is where I'm going to put the rails and then to give them some structure to brace it all I'm going to use 40 by 40 angle iron but underneath. So it's going to go in there and over there. And of course, same on the other side. I've been to the brambles and I've retrieved this, which is the box that came with Kermit. It's not a factory fitment, but it is the rather nicely made box that I didn't have a use for previously. I'm going to reinstate that in the same place as it was before, so there. And then with the seat pushed fully forward and wound forward, you can just about get access in there, which is where I can keep the um, breakdown kit, is what I'm thinking, so the, uh, the jack and the wheel brace, that sort of thing. Before I go any further with the seats though, I'm going to install the seat belts because I've got access to this corner down here, which is crucial for fitting the actual reel. I'm going to use a mixture of um, Range Rover seat belts and Discovery seat belts. They are compatible, it turns out or at least the ones I have are compatible. This is the Range Rover component, so it's the uh, twin buckles there, and a single buckle and a lap belt, because I might at some point put a middle seat in. And then this is the reel that came with the Discovery. I think this is actually one of the back seat reels, so it's hardly been used. 
that's going to go in to this corner here then it's going to go up to a shoulder bracket and down to another bracket which I'm going to fit down there. This is basically a standard defender installation so I'm going to have to make up um, something for this to bolt to in this corner but also another bracket that goes underneath and attaches to the chassis. So it goes chassis to the underneath of the seat box, pokes through the seat box and then there'll be another bracket sat on that and finally bolting onto this. That's the bottom mounting in. Now we've got to work out the top and get two bolts to go through there. Those two bolts will pop out here and take the other bracket, which will come um, that way and that way. And we start at 90 away from that. Uh, so I've just got to try and imagine how it's all going to go together now. If I can picture it, then I can get the holes in the optimum places. These are the nuts and bolts I'm going to be using. These are the proper um, sp specification for seat belts, uh, seat belt fittings. They're not metric, they're, um, they're UNF threads. I'll drill these at 11 and these at 12 because my plan is to weld the bolts in to this bracket. Plenty of space for the bolts, so um, these bolts will be captive to the lower bracket, and then this nut will be captive to this bracket. And what we need next is to attach this bit to something. I've got a pair of these, which are the um, I think series, but definitely Defender um, brackets that go up there, but not for a truck cab. They go up there for the um, the van body and the reason is on the truck cab you've got this curve where this wants to sit. There is a, a version for just for the truck cab and it connects up there and it's it looks like a bit of channel comes down and goes onto that stud there. But they're incredibly rare, well they're not, <laughs> you're not going to find them second hand, hardly ever. There is a remanufactured version, but they're about a hundred quid each. And they're not, I don't really like the design either. So I think I can do better using a pair of these. So what I'm going to do is put it where it wants to go, about there. And then I'm going to put a reinforcement around here. This is how the pack is going to be. It sits in there, nice and snug. And you can see it brings it down to just the right spot. And that will go in there like that. And then fix down there. So there's one coming down and three going up into the roof. Um, yes, the roof and the back of the cab holding it all together. Good. That's going to go in with one of those bolts. So we've now got the reel in, the shoulder bracket in. It goes across to that buckle. The last anchor point that's left is here. Going to go down there. And this is the easiest one. It's simply a case of putting in a uh, series anchor point. 
So I've got one of those for each side. And that just bolts in there. And that bolt will accommodate that one. Whew. <laughs> Took some doing. Here's where I've got to with the seat mountings. So I've drilled out all these holes um, in all four of the angle lines. Um, and now I'm going to go in there like that. And then when the seats go on, the seat rails that are on the seats will bolt through the seat box into this. And I think that'll be quite neat. Cool. I'm going to go and blast these and then I'll add them to the painting batch. So that sits in there really well, apart from the fact that there's a potential for rubbing against this edge. So I've come up with a solution, I've just got some garden hose and sliced it. It's an idea. But I think, yeah. one. Now when it comes to fitting to here and down here, I've been through my selection of um, seat belt fittings and found some bolts with um, shoulders on. So this bolt here has got a, quite a deep shoulder before the thread starts. That means it can go in there and I can put a spacer on the other side and then when I tighten up this bolt really tight the seat belt here will still be able to swivel. It's wound up nice and tight, then we can still move. So we've got one left to go then, down the bottom here.
I've got one other thing to go in here for now, and that's some floor mats. So I'm not going to have any carpet, I'm not going to have any sound insulation, soundproofing that can absorb water. There's, I made sure there's plenty of drain holes in the bottom of this floor, so that uh, when the water gets in, not if, but when the water gets in, it got, it's got somewhere to go. So in that vein, I'm going to just put rubber floor mats down, so that I have a slight deadening effect, but won't trap any water. Now you can immediately see a potential problem with these floor mats by the uh, branding on the box here. But they were the only ones I could find. Um, were the only ones I could find, I should say, that are supposed to fit a Series 3. Some brick part stuff is terrible, some of it's perfectly adequate. They look good so far. It's nice to be able to fit some accessories, not just vital stuff. Those mats fit really well. And with the added bonus, they match the wing tops. It's all rather splendid, I think. It feels like it's finally coming together, well, the, the interior I mean. Uh, doors next. Can we go find the doors? Now, I must admit, I've got almost no <laughs> recollection of how this all happens, but uh, I'm sure I'll work it out. So I got a stainless steel fixing kit for the um, doors because, well, <laughs> they're notorious for just jamming in there. Well, on a normal car it'd be somewhat dubious without fitting but for a Land Rover I think that's the best well, it's the best of any of mine anyway the only thing we could do now is to tip it that way ever so slightly um, but I'm going to wait until I put the the door top on before before I go ahead with that so it, it tucks in a bit more there than it does there but here at this end it's it's Spot on. That is very nice. This is the type of striker mechanism that I'm going to use. It's not the type that came with Kermit. The one that came with Kermit was just a sort of like a, like a spike that sticks out. Sort of thing you catch your trousers on when you jump out. How far we cut that down? I'll do for now. I'm going to get in and go for a drive around the property. And that'll do us for this episode, actually. In the next episode, I'm going to aim for a, an actual road test. Not just around here, but on the public roads. So, join me for that. Cheers for now.